Jet Force Gemini, does the 1999 sci-fi interplanetary action adventure shooter still hold up 20 years later? After just finishing the game again, I'm more than ready to answer that question. This bug splatting adventure I feel never got much attention somehow, even while under the golden spotlight of 90s Rare, the same team that continues to get love for Goldeneye and Banjo-Kazooie. My only guess for that is both its late arrival on the Nintendo 64 platform and the third person control scheme conflicting with everyone's idea of shooter games all needing to be first person perspective. Or perhaps sci-fi themes just aren't as popular as conventional themes. After all, Perfect Dark, another sci-fi shooter late to the N64, also from Rare, did not and still does not get nearly as much attention as Goldeneye despite how clearly superior it is. So, in ignoring Jet Force Gemini, what did the world miss out on? Well, the backstory is nothing too amazing. It's your basic sci-fi setup, where a fleet led by some all-seeing federation is being bombarded by some intergalactic tyrant, in this case a giant bug warlord by the name of Mizar. The federation's Jet Force fleet finds itself completely destroyed, with the exception of one ship whose hyperdrive unit is out of commission. On board are Juno and Vela, twins, and their assigned military-trained dog, Lupus. All three soldiers have been outfitted with military enhancements. Juno wears special armor that protects him from heat even as high as lava. Vela's lungs have been implanted with a device that allows her to breathe underwater and in toxic environments indefinitely. Lupus the dog has his four legs infused with thrusters, allowing him to hover for short periods of time. These three traits become a crucial element to the gameplay and exploration. The Jet Force team finds themselves with no choice but to flee their ship and make for a nearby planet called Goldwood, home to the peace-loving bear-like race called Tribals. Mizar and his insect drones have invaded and enslaved the Tribals, and now it's up to Juno, Vela, and Lupus to both rescue them all and stop Mizar for good. The first impression of the game leaves us judging its graphics and controls, and both categories are probably the weakest part of the game. The graphics are well enough when you remember that we're talking about 1999 here, but the draw distance, smoothing, and even the frame rate at times are hard to go back to if you aren't regularly playing retro 3D games. The game utilized many lighting effects advanced for its time, but in retrospect, it leaves many areas of the game too dark, unless you really crank up your TV's brightness. Combined with the N64's terrible ability to see anything far away with any kind of detail, and the grainy edges of every polygon, it's a dark, fuzzy battle on your eyes, especially if you try playing on an HD TV because the world hates staying in the past and only sells them now. Of course, if you are an Xbox owner, you can always enjoy the game updated for modern times on Rare Replay. But back to the Nintendo 64, we have to discuss the controls. It was designed with the N64 controller in mind, so that means no dual analog. So if you plan on playing this game on an emulator using a modern controller, you will have a very rough time assigning buttons to anything comfortable. Even back then, when we didn't know any better, it still felt a little bit odd. The game defaults to what they refer to as the expert control scheme, in which the almighty A and B buttons so commonly used otherwise are nothing more than used to switch weapons. The control stick moves your character, the Z trigger fires, and the left and right C buttons strafe. C up strangely makes you jump, and if you hold it down it makes you super jump. C down makes you duck first and then crawl. Stranger yet is holding the R button enters manual aiming, which now reverses the control stick and the C buttons, meaning you now move your character with the C buttons and use the control stick to aim. It's all kind of wonky, but after some time with it, you find it is responsive and pretty smooth. Developers, especially one as experienced as Rare, know that third-person shooters are kind of awkward, and so they made two very important decisions here. One, they developed a very fine-tuned auto-aim system whenever you are in third-person mode. As long as you are mostly facing an enemy, you'll hit him dead center, making clearing most rooms a breeze. Secondly, they implemented a versatile manual aim mode to compensate for those moments where third-person just won't get the job done. Where some older games restrict you to standing still while precision aiming, Jet Force Gemini allows you to continue running and strafing, and very quickly you'll find yourself staying only in that mode, switching to third person only to make quick work of bugs here and there. Okay, so that's the graphics and controls. It's kind of sloppy, but it works well enough. A solid 7 out of 10, maybe a 6.5 during those really weird platforming moments. And as I said before, those are the worst aspects of the game, so let's move on to the gameplay itself. Jet Force Gemini is a third-person shooter with adventure-like elements and arcade-like elements, and the end result is a pretty fun package. 
The adventure aspect involves you traveling across over a dozen planets, each of which has hidden weapons and other collectibles, some of which you'll have to backtrack to later on to fully explore, much like you would in, say, a Metroid or Zelda game. And much like in those games, that excitement of discovery runs high in the moment. Like when you spot a hidden underwater tunnel and say, oh, I need to come back here with Vela. You do just that and then cover a hidden village with an alternate exit that leads to an entirely new planet. That stuff is sprinkled all over Jet Force Gemini. The arcade aspect comes in the sense that it is a room by room shoot 'em up. Most areas prevent advancement until all enemies are destroyed, and that is mostly a good thing. Using your wide arsenal to splatter bug guts all over the walls is a ton of fun, and running past all of that would be robbing yourself of that pleasure. The rooms feature a nice variety of enemy types too, with your typical ground drones running around, snipers perched atop crates and trees, aerial squadrons that attack in formations, and giant bugs with heavy firepower guarding doorways and other things of interest. The weapons are all a lot of fun to use, especially the tri-rocket launcher. No reloads and three rockets at a time that deal tons of damage? How can you go wrong? Well, actually, you can go wrong in one way that most people complain about. You can decapitate an innocent teddy bear. Nah, who cares, right? You're not going for 100%. Well, unfortunately, you find out halfway through the game that you need to rescue every single tribal in the game just to beat it. If you know where they are and the fastest way to get all of them, it's really not that bad. But for the casual first-time player, this mechanic will likely drive you insane. Finding the little guys isn't too difficult, as they're usually just hanging out in the open, but that's also the problem. Enemies have a habit of pulling out grenades out of nowhere while you're shooting them, and well, the result is a massive explosion you can do nothing about that takes the lives of several innocent teddy bears. That gets put on your permanent record, so to speak, and you have no choice but to either finish the stage or save and reset. The stages vary in length and required room, so often it isn't too troublesome, but on the off chance this happens in one of the longer stages after like 10 minutes of trying to save them all, you will most likely be frustrated. Perhaps to add to the annoyance too is that some of the tribals can only be saved by specific characters. For example, the spawn ship level ones can only be collected by Vela since there is a stash of them hidden behind an underwater tunnel. The tribals aren't saved when you collect them and must all be collected in one pass of an area. So yes, this is the most complained about aspect of the game, as even the most knowledgeable and skilled players can still lose out due to a random grenade. Otherwise though, a perfect playthrough only requires a tiny bit of backtracking, and it combines with the excitement of discovering new areas, so the tribals aren't as much of a burden as people make them out to be. The planets and warships are all diverse as well, and basically all of them are awesome to explore, keeping the same mechanic of destroying all enemies somehow fresh. The first half of the game involves all three characters exploring three different planets each, the last of which involves a unique boss character. These bosses are big and nasty, but they clearly show off their weakness with a flashing animation, and therefore mostly are a pushover, with the occasional exception. They are still awesome nonetheless, and the music while fighting them is good, which brings me to the final area worth discussing, the music. The soundtrack of Jet Force Gemini is easily a 10 out of 10 and propels the game to heights it would otherwise be unable to achieve on its own. Mostly every track is an orchestrated climb to a climactic melody followed by a quieting down, all supported by a looming, suspenseful drum and bass line. The level design is built around this, and the two complement each other well. There really is something spectacular about exploding giant squadrons of bugs while horns and strings blare loudly, or even just running down dark, twisted corridors while drums haunt the air, pounding like a heartbeat, leaving you wondering what foul assortment of beasts awaits around the next bend.
It's an overused word, but in this case, it correctly fits. The music of Jet Force Gemini is epic. Each track fits the environment perfectly, and you could ask for nothing more. And because it's rare, they even put in a hidden rave club with four complimentary songs and an arcade game. Which, oh yeah, speaking of that, not only is Jet Force Gemini a third-person shooter action adventure, but it has both a 2D racer and a 3D racer built in that can also be enjoyed in multiplayer. The 3D racer takes after F-Zero with fast-paced cars and super fast turns, but also features power-up elements like Diddy Kong Racing. Which, speaking of, Greenwood Village is an unlockable course for multiplayer. Sure, overall it's very basic, but still very cool considering the core game we're talking about is a third-person shooter, not a racing game. So does Jet Force Gemini still hold up 20 years later? To me, there's no expiration date on a fun experience, and Jet Force Gemini offers that. It's definitely dated in appearance and other mechanics, but for fans of retro games who could care less about modernization and just want to have fun and bask in memories, this game has it all. Like any old game, however, I will say it takes some effort to get into. There are many times I sit there staring at the cartridge and think, is it time? And then I sigh and say, nah, it's not time yet, sorry Jet Force. And then I go crawl away somewhere and fill my time with some mundane activity like laundry. But just like reading a book, once you get a few chapters in, you're hooked and you can't stop. With a fun variety of weapons, cool characters with varied abilities, over a dozen awesome environments to explore with very well designed rooms, outstanding and suspenseful music, and hundreds of bugs to splat along the way, Jet Force Gemini is nothing short of a great game that should have never been passed up in the first place. And if you enjoyed this brief review, be sure to check out the playlist on my channel that features some other reviews I've done in the past. I'm Bill from Good Old Days Gaming, and thanks for watching.